wonderful. So welcome to the Iran Colloquium. My name is Travis Sade. I am the director of Yale's program in Iranian studies. It's really honored to to welcome all of you to this, uh, our last uh, lecture for the year. And we're, we're truly blessed to be joined by Professor Hamid Abashi of Columbia University to finish out the semester. Today, my colleague Sam uh, Samuel Hodgkin in the Department of Comparative Literature will present and moderate the conversation. But before turning it over to Sam, I'd, I'd like to note the format. This is a webinar. Uh, and Professor Debashi will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes or so. This will be followed by questions and answers. And feel free to write any questions you might have down in the Q&A function of the Zoom uh, app uh, there uh, along the way. Sam will then moderate any questions that come up. Um, I'd also like to note that we have a wonderful lineup of lectures planned for the spring. And, and without further ado, I, I will turn it over to Sam. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Travis, and, and uh, thank you also, Marajan, Kristen, Marwa, Lizzie, everyone involved in making today's talk possible. And I'll, I'll say right at the outset that uh, since I came to Yale a few years ago, bringing today's speaker for an Iran colloquium talk has been my fondest hope. Uh, his stature in Iranian studies is only one facet of a brilliantly multifaceted career that has illuminated such a wide range of topics in literary, film studies, the visual arts, politics and theology, reflecting on both the long durée of Islamic culture and the urgent demands of our moment. It's therefore a real privilege for all of us to have the opportunity to hear him today, bringing that breadth of vision to bear on two thinkers as dear to all of us in Iranian studies as Ibn Sina and Sohravardi. Uh, our guest is Hamid Dabashi, the Hagop Kavorkian Professor of Iranian Studies and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. Professor Dabashi was born in Ahvaz in Iran, and it was following his university education in Tehran that he came to the U.S. to the University of Pennsylvania to complete a dual PhD in Sociology of Culture and Islamic Studies, writing his dissertation under the prominent Freudian cultural critic Philip Reif on the Weberian theory of charismatic authority. And his books are far too numerous to list, and it would be still more overwhelming to list the languages into which they have been translated or the national academies in which they have had an eager, vibrant reception, leaving aside his even more numerous and influential articles. In general, we might think of his early work, corresponding roughly to the 80s, as an extended exploration of modes of authority in Islam, in classical Islam, but necessarily also with an eye to the very immediate Iranian revolutionary context in which many centuries of vibrant 12 or Shiite radical political theology were being distorted and diminished um, both in the Islamic revolutionary government and in Western Orientalist explanations of the background of the revolution. Many of Professor Dabashi's works in the 90s therefore turn to intellectual and cultural production, both in post-78 Iran and in the swelling Iranian diaspora, introducing an international public to contemporary theater, propaganda posters, and by the early 2000s, especially film. Not only the film of Iran and its diaspora, but also committed filmmakers elsewhere, such as Palestine. And I'll say that I am especially grateful for the writings that have emerged from his long engagement with the several incredible filmmakers of the Mahmal Bof family. Um, after 9-11, Professor Dabashi faced the demands of the moment, um, truly, uh, with books such as Islamic Liberation Theology um, and Iran, A People Interrupted, His Influential History of Modern Iran, along with reflections on the Arab Spring, the Iranian Green Movement, and on the legacies of Orientalism, nationalism, and the post-colonial project of his predecessor at Columbia, Edward Said. In this period, in American public culture, he came to occupy the role of a public intellectual in the true Saidian sense. But at the same time, especially in recent years, he has also engaged closely with the history of colonialism in Iran with recent books, including Persophilia and Reversing the Colonial Gaze, Persian Travelers Abroad, and he has returned, uh, and this, today's talk has to do with this as well, has returned to a longer view of Islamic thought and Persian culture with his books, The Shahnama, The Persian Epic and World Literature, and The World of Persian Literary Humanism, a, a book whose political program for the field has 
deeply shaped my work. Um, I, I apologize for this long introduction, which I've tried to keep short in spite of its prolific subject. Uh, so I won't go on about Professor Dabashi's role in shaping Middle East studies, comparative literature, and the core curriculum at Columbia over the years, though that role too has been very important. Instead, I will hurry on with excitement to turn over the mic to Professor Dabashi. Welcome, and thank you for speaking today. Thank you, Sam. Uh, most grateful for that very generous introduction. Uh, and to my other colleague, to Marjan Vardaki, for kindly inviting me in the middle of the summer, and to Professor Travis Zadev and uh, all other colleagues at Yale. I was sharing with them that, uh, to the best of my recollection, this is the first time I've actually been invited to Yale. We are very close. I wish I could be there in person, but because of my commitments of various sorts here in New York and at Columbia, alas, I couldn't. I very much look forward to seeing my, uh, especially younger colleagues who are now the, the field, the, the discipline is in their uh, capable hands. I always think that the preliminary work that my generation has done, some of it uh, might be of some use for the next generation, which is, uh, academically, linguistically, uh, scholarly terms is uh, in a far better, it's a major epistemic shift of uh, what they are doing. And I hope and pray and do my best still to, re to remain relevant to what uh, they, are, they are doing. Now, the topic of my talk today is uh, uh, the, when uh, Marjan called me, I was in a playful mood, and I thought Yale, well, there are two distinguished uh, scholars at Yale, Dimitri Gutas, for whom I have utmost admiration of his extraordinary work on Avicenna in particular, and one is Paul Dumont. Paul Dumont has a book, uh, Allegories of Reading. So I reversed it and said, uh, reading allegories and allegories of reading. Now, the point of this title is reference to the uh, peculiar work of Avicenna and uh, Sohravardi uh, that has baffled generations of scholars from his own contemporaries down to ours, because they are in a language that is, doesn't dovetail with other, uh, their other work. Uh, Hay ibn Yavzan is one of those uh, uh, works. The, uh, the second one is uh, Salamon wa Absal, Salamon wa Absal. And the third is Rasala to Tayr. And uh, I have been, uh, for some reason, I haven't, I don't analyze myself, increasingly drawn to these works that was subsequently picked up by Suhravardi. Uh, and Ibn Tufail uh, and expanded upon and, and so forth. Uh, uh, I've been drawn to them, uh, been writing on them, but still I'm not uh, satisfied. I still see, think there is, uh, there is more to this. And given the history of how uh, Muslim scholars, beginning with the time of Avicenna himself uh, and his students and his followers, uh, we're mesmerized by these stories, some positively and some not so positively. Uh, that has sustained itself and come to our time with basically two major schools of thought about how to read them. One of them is by uh, Dimitri Gutas, our uh, distinguished uh, colleague from Yale, who has, uh, is a solid scholar of Avicenna and has written on these issues that he constitutes, let's say, one school of uh, how to read these texts. And then the opposing school is by the French uh, scholar, Henri Corbin, who also, uh, in fact, before uh, Dimitri Gutas was drawn to these uh, stories. And uh, uh, so these are the last kind of two major scholarly renditions and uh, interpretations of these stories. Uh, 
and it comes down to us. The first thing I want to do is just to refresh your memory as to what we're talking about. What are these stories? What is peculiar about the language and why this language is so compelling and so uh, mesmerizing? By reading uh, a few sentences from the opening uh, gambit of uh, Risale, Agle Sorch, uh, what actually we call these writings, some call it allegory, some call it, uh, uh, Henri Corbin called it uh, récit uh, visionnaire, uh, vis uh, visionary recitals. Uh, in Persian and Arabic scholarship, they're always referred to as tamsil in the classical sense, not in the contemporary sense of tamsil. Uh, and here in this uh, critical edition that goes back to 1960s by Seyd Hossein Nasr, we have a sort of introduction to the text that refers to it as Rasala, Hazahi Rasala, Mausum Ba'agl Surf, half Arabic, half Persian. This is a treatise known as Agl Surf, Red Intellect. And then Le Sheikh Al Ilahi Al Rabbani, Shahabuddin Sohrawardi, to uh, spiritual master, Shahabuddin uh, Sohrawardi. Uh, and the, the thing about this uh, opening gambit, simply to uh, refresh your memory as to why uh, this prose is so compelling and so important and so captured the imagination of generations of Muslim and non-Muslim scholars, is the first paragraph starts very simply, very much innocuously, very similar to other similar treatises, uh, again, half Persian, half Arabic. Praise be to the Lord that both worlds belong to him. This is an ontological proposition. The existence of whoever exists belongs to him. Two words, bud and hast, uh, come together. Whoever has existed, his existence or her existence or their existence, as you know, fortunately in Persian, we don't have uh, gender specific pronoun. Whoever exists is because of his existence. And then switches to a Quranic Arabic. Uh, citing uh, Verse 57 of Surah Al Hadid, uh, uh, verse number three. Uh, and then switches back to Persian. You know, peace and benedictions be upon his messenger. Especially to Muhammad, the uh, selected one. That he sealed Nubuwa uh, with him. So that's the first paragraph. It's pretty much a standard of what we call in Arabic and Persian how a, a treatise like this starts. It is the second paragraph that it is nothing short of a stunt. You don't know what to do with this uh, second paragraph. This is how it starts. Dusti as dustan aziz This is typical. Not, does not necessarily mean literally a friend asked me, but sort of sets up. A friend asked me, a, a dear friend asked me, Ke zabani yek digar do birds speak? Do they understand each other, birds? Guftan bali donan. I said, yes, they understand. Guftura az kujo malum gasht. This dialogical prose is, is extraordinary. Because this friend asks him questions that you, we, Sam might ask, I might ask. Go to ask Kojoma Luga. She says, How do you know? Guftam darab tida ye halat, chun musabere behagirat, hoske beniyat, mara padidor konat, mara dar surate bozi opari. Borrows the philosophical language and says that when the former of the form or former of truth wanted 
or intended بنیت, intended to create me مرا در صورت بازی آفرید created me like a falcon now who is this I talking is this a play is an omniscient narrator is it Sohravardi? what difference does it make any of these answers بدن و در آن ولایت که من بودم دیگر بازان بودند and that in that uh, domain ولایت that I was there were other falcons ما با یک دیگر سخن گفتیم و شنیدیم و سخن یک دیگر فهم می کردیم we used to talk to each other we used to chat and we understood each other گفت آنگه حال بدین مقام چگونه رسی the friend says then what happened گفتم روزی سیادان روزی سیادان قضا و قدر دام تقدیر باز گسترانیدن so one day these uh, hunters were uh, were coming towards us و دانی ارادت در آن تعبیه کردن when they were spreading seeds now he sort of creates uh, kind of a mystical uh, twist to this دانی ارادت the seeds of devotion و مرا بدین طریق اسیر گردانیدن and thus I was captured پس از آن ولایت که آشیان ما بود به ولایت دیگر بردن then they took us from the land the domain where we were somewhere else آنگاه هر دو چشم من بردوفتند then they blindfolded me و چهار بند مختلف نهادند و ده کس را بر من موکل گرده now it starts a numerology that people read it differently چهار بند مختلف نهاد there were four ties around my eyes ده کس را بر من موکل کردند ten people were watching me پنج را رو سوی من و پشت بیرون و پنج را پشت سوی من و روی به بیرون Five of these ten guards were facing me with their back uh, towards the outside and the other five, five the other way around. There is a dramaturgical mise-en-scene to all of this. In panj ke rui sui man daashtan, the five that were facing me va pushte ishan birun at their back towards the uh, outside, angah mara dar alam تحیر بداشتند they kept me in a state of wonder چنان که آشیان خیش و آن ولایت و هر چه معلوم بود فراموش کردم من این uh, 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 forgetfulness descended upon me because of these circumstances و می پنداشتم که من پیوست خود چنین بودم and thus I assume that I have always been like that that's, that's how the, the story begins and the bafflement of this prose, first of all, is not compatible. There are few phrases that you see with philosophical intonations, some with mystical intonations. Uh, but that is not how uh, an ordinary philosophical treatise is written. Now, the original three, Rasala to Teir, and uh, uh, Salomon Absal and Hay ibn Yaghzan by Avicenna, they were written in Arabic. And then uh, Nasir al-Din Tusi wrote uh, an, uh, an explanation of this in his Sharh al-Isharat, the uh, commentary that he wrote on Avicenna's al-Isharat wa tanbihat one of the, his most significant works. But what happens with Sohravadi's tradition and later on with Ibn Tufayl is that uh, Sohravadi writes both in Persian and in Arabic. Some of the, uh, 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 these uh, allegories, these treatises are in Arabic, uh, like the Qista Qurbat al the uh, story of the uh, Occidental exile, and some are in Persian, such as uh, this one on Aglesov, the red intellect. And this linguistic uh, differential is something that interests me uh, greatly. Now, 
what is the state of scholarship right now? I'm going to read for you uh, the opening paragraph of a wonderful essay by Sarah Strumsa, who wrote this uh, article back in 1992. And uh, her point of contention is that these are philosophical stories and they uh, point back to Aristotle's poetics and uh, reinterprets Aristotle's poetics. That's her sort of take. But the opening paragraph of this essay by uh, Sarah Strumsa uh, kind of sums up the, the situation. Among Avis, I'm, and I'm uh, citing her. Among Avicenna's many works, his stories, and here she calls it stories, essays. Well, as you just saw in the original is Rasala. She's not the only one. There are all sorts of uh, stories. In fact, Kurban goes out of her, his way to say why he doesn't call them allegories. And he prefers this récit or uh, visionnaire, visual recital, uh, visionary recitals. But uh, Sarah Strumsa calls them stories, essas, have a very special place by virtue both of their form and of their content. Now, in my way of sort of literary sensibilities, I don't make a distinction of form and content, they're all related, but here she is. While most of Avicenna's shorter compositions are devoted to specific problems in the stories, in these stories, Avicenna endeavors to present his philosophy as a whole, though in a miniature version. You see, my issue begins is, I have no idea that this is actually what we are reading in Avicenna, that he is, he wants to express his philosophical treatises in this particular language. So there is a leap of faith here, which as a scholar, I trust a colleague who says this, but I don't necessarily go along with it. But the scholars disagree as to the nature of this philosophy. Does it represent Aristotelian teaching? or profound spiritual gnosis, question mark. And here my mind begins to, to wonder as a literary person, how, what about if they're okay, they have some philosophical import and they have some spiritual gnosis, but what is paramount, what is most striking, what draws me is not that, oh, okay, I'm not being exposed to Aristotelian, uh, Abyssinian philosophy predicated on Aristotelian in a new language, but there is something about these stories, the, the, the surface of them, that is fascinating. The scholars agree that the stories are written in a peculiar style, absolutely, but disagree as to the philosophical significance of this fact. So you see, the con contention has been sort of taken to the field of uh, as philosophical treatises because the writers were philosophers, uh, what do they mean? A.M. Goichon, one of the earliest scholars who have written on this, indeed believe that it has none, okay? For her, Avicenna wrote the stories as, quote, a poetic and profound game, okay? To divert him during his imprisonment in Faragon. We know historically that he wrote this when he was in jail. For Dimitri Gutas, the stories represent an example of the symbolic method as used by the Aristotelian philosopher. Since the symbolic method is, quote, by its very nature, inferior, I'm quoting, to the demonstrative. Its main function must also be modest. This is uh, Dimitri Gutas. To impart to the common people, I mean, back in the 11th century, I don't know what's common people. Philosophy and mysticism, et cetera, they're, these are very specific discourses. They're very limited audiences. So I don't know who is common people. That much of the knowledge as is necessary for their social and eschatological well-being, end of quote, citing Dimitri Gutas. This is his take. Henri Corbin alone, I'm still continuing to cite uh, Sarah Surumsa. Henri Corbin alone granted the style of the stories profound philosophical significance. 
regarding them as visionary recitals, end of quote. And then she goes on to uh, talk about her own take and gives us a history of Avicenna's stories, Hay ibn Yaghzan, uh, Salamana Absal, and the Epistle of the Birds. She also continues to tell us the literary background that, that there were stories like this, like the Epistle of, the Epistle of Animals or Rekilila uh, Wadimna before Avicenna. And then continues to sort of uh, trace the later philosophical stories that happen after uh, Avicenna. And then uh, uh, follows with Avicenna's disciples, uh, what they were doing, and comes to uh, Dimitri Putas and the rest of them. It's an excellent, extraordinary essay, which I highly recommend, both for her own interpretation of these stories, but also for uh, uh, sort of a summary of what has happened. Now, if we shift language, and uh, move to uh, material written on the same stories in Persian, we see a slight kind of modification, slight changes. As I said, linguistic differentials are very important to me as a literary scholar. And basically what you have, you have the scholarship that has pr been produced uh, in, on these uh, uh, stories, are either in Arabic, the original language in which most of them were written, or in Persian, uh, the language in which some of these treatises were written, but contemporary scholarship, Ziauddin uh, Sajjadi is one example of them, or in French, or in English. Now, here there is a uh, I would ordinarily call it power differential among these four languages. That those who write in French, for example, like Corban, they ordinarily don't read English. They read Arabic and Persian, but the originals, not the scholarship done in these languages. Those who write in English, they are aware of the scholarship done in French or other languages, but not of the scholarship done in Persian and in Arabic. They are aware of the original sources, uh, but you might say that uh, Korban pays more attention to the Persian material, Butas pays more attention to the Arabic material, which is, that's, that's fine, but they are not aware of what is happening with contemporary uh, scholarship. Now, this creates for me, uh, a kind of a, a triangulation, huh? Tri three uh, differentials. One is linguistic, right now, you see it, a linguistic differential. Uh, Arabic, Persian, uh, French, and uh, English. Now, there are other uh, European languages like German or Spanish, etc. but for the sake of sort of brevity, let's just limit it to these two. But, uh, for me, equally important is the temporal differential. The reason for that is that when Corban, the, the scholarship of Butas, unfortunately, is not very well known in Persian, but the scholarship of Corban, for obvious reason, he used to go to Iran, he lived in Iran, he uh, knew Iranian scholars, etc. The scholarship of Corban is very much uh, known and translated into Persian. To the best of my knowledge, Gutas has not been translated, but he may have. But even if he has, uh, that scholarship is limited to the field of scholarship, not popular. Whereas the translations of Kurban into Persian entered into public domain. And I will give you a specific example uh, shortly. So, temporal differentials, namely what happens to these stories when they are translated into Persian or Arabic, and then contemporary writers, scholars, poets, novelists, filmmakers, etc., begin to read them and be influenced on them. The third differential 
is, uh, is a theoretical differential because uh, as a scholar of allegory, I, for one, given my own trajectory of scholarship, cannot attend to an allegorical story or the question of allegory without immediately thinking of two seminal theorists or philosophers, theorists of allegory. One is uh, Walter Benjamin, who wrote on allegory. In fact, uh, his major uh, work on, uh, on uh, German uh, drama is on allegory. And one, of course, is Paul Dumont on allegories of reading. So there is a, ordinarily, neither Benjamin nor uh, uh, Paul Dumont are part of and parcel of this scholarship. This is something that interests me and I find it helpful and insightful to some, in some modest way. But uh, to sum it up, there are these three uh, differentials, uh, linguistic, temporal, and theoretical that uh, uh, interests me at this stage. Now I want to, as I did with the other uh, uh, colleague, I want to just share with you how does uh, somebody like Sajjadi uh, think and write. I will just quickly translate. I would not read you the original. What uh, Sajjadi is telling us is that he was a, when he was a, a student, he first encountered Salomon Absal in Jami. Jami, as you know, in the 16th century, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, masteries of uh, Haft Orang is on Salomon Absal, which later reaches uh, Fitzgerald, and Fitzgerald translates it into English and becomes popular after Omar Khayyam. Uh, this book that Sajjadpur talks about is about uh, Jami, written by a doyen of literary scholarship, Ali Asghar Hikmat, based on uh, Salomon Absal. Then eventually, uh, in various journals, uh, another prominent Iranian scholar, Mehdi Bayani, translate Hay ibn Yaghzan of uh, Avicenna uh, that had been attributed to Abu Ubaid Juzjani, his student. And eventually these two stories begin to become, uh, and, and subsequently Korban is translated. Korban's uh, original uh, S, uh, book was in 1953 and it was very soon translated into uh, Persian. Then the uh, uh, millenary of Avicenna happens and more people are paying attention to this uh, 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 stories and so forth and goes on and on when, for example, the, another great scholar, uh, uh, Furuzan Far writes a major work on uh, Hayya ibn Yaghzan, uh, et cetera. Now, the point is that when you read uh, Sajjadpur and you read uh, Srosman, you see that there are two different provenances. Now, they both are talking about Avicenna uh, and in the case of Sajjadpur also uh, Sohravardi's work, but they are not entirely uh, on the same page. Uh, what happens with this, uh, kind of uh, differentials, linguistic uh, differentials, which originates in the, the actual essays, some written in Arabic, beginning with Avicenna, but eventually, trans, uh, eventually rendered uh, different versions into Persian, uh, and they sort of continue their life in uh, this bilingual disposition, and eventually reach uh, our uh, uh, generation. Now, uh, here I want to share some of the, how much time I have, 12.36, I still have, have some time. Uh, I, have, I want to share some of my concerns about how do we translate these, what is the name of these uh, kinds of prose? Some have called them allegories, but in terms of, there are wonderful essays in Persian about the dramaturgical aspects, and uh, some, there are books on them as uh, tamsil, uh, coming from the Arabic of uh, uh, similitude. Mm -hmm. 
uh, some, as I said, Corban calls them Recit Visionnaire. Uh, some in Persian call it Tamsil Erfani, Gnostic, uh, very similar to it, and uh, so forth and so on. Uh, what, as a result, is the issue for me is what happens to a contemporary, and I mean 20th and 21st century, a uh, creative writer uh, that is influenced by these translations. One of the immediate examples that comes to mind is an absolutely astonishing novel by Shahnush Parsipur, a contemporary novelist. And the novel is called Aql Abi, The Blue Intellect, that is a straightforward uh, conversation or uh, encounter with Avicenna's Agle Sorch. And here I'd like to share a, a, an anecdote. Once years ago, I was having dinner with Sharnush Parsipur, and uh, on the dinner table, there was a candle. And she pointed to candle and said, if you look at the composition of the light that comes from the candle, you see that originally is blue, then becomes uh, red. And then she said, I was, uh, so Ravari paid attention to the red intellect, whereas in my work, I pay attention to the blue intellect. It's a fantastic novel. I, uh, I think it has been translated into English, and I highly recommend it. Anything that Shannon Sparsipur writes is uh, magnificent. But the point is not uh, uh, whether or not one agrees or disagrees with that kind of interpretation, but the presence of Sohravardi as a prose stylist, more than anything else, as a prose stylist, in a contemporary setting that the leading Iranian novelist like Shahnu Parsipur begins to turn around Agle Sorch, the red intellect, into a profoundly feminist take on the question of reason and intellect in this book uh, called uh, Agle Sorf. Now, this one example, I'll give you another example, and then I stop, 12.39, so we have time for a conversation. The other example I want to give is from contemporary Iranian cinema, particularly the work of two uh, filmmakers, one was the late Sohrab Shahid Saleh, uh, who uh, began his career inside Iran, but then soon in the 1970s, he left for Germany and continued his filmmaking in Germany, became a prominent figure in Germany, and ultimately he died in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, one of his major first films that he made on, uh, while he was in Germany is called Dar Gurbat. Dar Gurbat. This word Gurbat is, which is the uh, the same word that appears in the Sey Gurbat al of Sohravadi, is a peculiar word because yes, it means exile, but it also means solitude. It is a rich word, Arib and Gurbat. Uh, I mean, ultimately, the root of it is uh, the West, the going west, Gurub from sunset. Uh, and then it, this uh, reminded me that the word uh, Qarib and Gurbat has a lot of res resonances in other Iranian films. Bashu uh, Qaribi uh, Kuchak, a major, major event in Iranian cinema by Bahram Bezai, Bashu, the little stranger, Qaribi Kuchak. And uh, another film of Bezai is Qaribe wa Meh, The Stranger and the Fog. But as I said, a stranger does not do quite justice to the Persian Qaribe or uh, Orban. So there are uh, uh, quite a number of references to this that I am not suggesting a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the translations and availability of right now, I have a, uh, the original critical edition of uh, uh, these Persian treatises of Sohravadi done by Seyed Hossein Anas uh, in 
the, the date that comes at the end of Seto Sinas uh, introduction is 2,535 on then the imperial calendar. He was close to the monarchy, but it translates into uh, 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 1976, just before the revolution. And this availability of these uh, sources became uh, historically and socially and culturally extremely influential uh, at the time. So this uh, not suggesting a one-to-one -one correspondence, I am suggesting the question of going West or being in the West or a lonesome in the West became an issue that had multiple manifestations. Now, uh, I want to conclude by uh, sharing with you the, again, opening paragraph of one of my most recent work, which has not been published yet, uh, in which I pay attention to this of Sohravardi. And Qasse, I translated for my purposes, Ballad, the Ballad of the Occidental Exile. Nobody, to the best of my knowledge, has used the word ballad uh, for these kinds of stories, but I have reasons to believe that uh, this word would be useful. Now, the, the opening gambit, again, my own, begins not with Sohravardi, but with a poem of Mehdi Akhavan Sales. This is one of those cases of temporal differentials called Qasidak or Dandelion. In one sort of short phrase in that poem, uh, Akhavan says, Dast bardar az in dar vatan khish qarib. Let me be an exile that I am in my own homeland. Then I do my own translation. Faxton has done an absolutely stellar work translating sort of these stories into English. Competent, readable, wonderful. But if, like me, you're a literary scholar, you are grateful to those who have done work in translation, but we are attached to the uh, to the original, and then we do our own translation. So my own translation of a passage from Qasir Gurbat Gharbiye is as follows. When I traveled with my brother Osem from the region of Trans Transoxiana to the lands of the Occident in order to hunt down a flock of birds, on the shore of the Green Sea, we suddenly fell into a town whose inhabitants were wicked. That is the town of Qairawan. When the people perceived that we had come amongst them unexpectedly, we being sons of the elder known as Al-Hadi ibn Al-Khair Al-Yamani, al Yamani. Al they surrounded us and took us bound and shackles and fetters of iron and imprisoned us at the bottom of an infinitely deep pit. End of quote. I'll read you a quick paragraph as to what I'm doing with this, and then I conclude. This is the opening gambit of the Ballad of the Occidental Exile, one of the most beloved and widely read and celebrated allegorical stories of the 12th century Persian philosopher Shahabuddin Yahya Sohravadi. Sohravadi himself tells us this is a story he wrote as a response to Avicenna's similar allegories, which he found suggestive, but not sufficiently understood. Generations of Muslims and non-Muslim philosophers have written commentaries on these stories. These allegories resemble, resemble numerous other occasions from the poetry of Rumi to the philosophy of Avicenna, where the idea of exile as both factual and allegorical has had countless occasions to show itself in Persian literary imagination. In contemporary Iranian cinema, this is I'm, the differential that I sort of introduced is not just in terms of temporal, but also in terms of genre. In contemporary Iran cinema, the idea of Qarib and Qaribe as a stranger and exile shows itself in, uh, for example, two of Beizai's films, Qaribe and the Fog, 1976, and Bashud al Stranger, 1986. 
The peculiar thing about the word Qarib and Qaribe is that it means both a strange, a stranger and exile. But the idea finds its most powerful manifestation in the persona and the cinema of Sohrab Shahid Salis, one of the leading figures of Iranian cinema. One of the most beloved and admired Iranian filmmakers who began his career in Iran, but ended in self-imposed exile from his homeland. The idea of cinematic exile as a result is crucial here, rooted as it is, I am proposing in this story of Sohrab Ali, because the site of the exilic condition is where the normative and habitual forms of belonging are all made look a stranger and outlandish. For here, the artist become a stranger to himself or her herself. Exile is away from home where the habitual formations of identity are all imperceptibly dissolved <clears throat> into alterity. There's a little, little bit of Levinas into this, but I will not uh, dwell on it. And the knowing subject, becomes positively and productively unknowing. Himself exiled from his Palestinian homeland by force, Edward Said theorized the condition of exile as the ideal state of being an intellectual or a critical thinker, even if one lives in one's own homeland. Adorno was his uh, model. Questions of gender and sexuality are particularities of the larger issues of the dialectic between self and society or home and exile, which is always mitigated through the aesthetic functions of verisimilitude and metonymic allusions, otherwise impossible to register without the central role of what the Russian formalist Viktor Shkolovsky called ostranenei, estrangement. Being in exile is the locus classicus of becoming a stranger and on and on. I don't want to dwell it. I simply wanted to share the way that I am proposing we need to sort of reconsider. Is it possible to read them in my judgment? And I put this uh, as a proposal to you. Yes. But we need uh, to uh, posit multiple. Uh, differentials, linguistic differentials, uh, temporal dif differentials, genre differentials, uh, as in the case of Agla Abi, the blue intellect and the red intellect, as well as theoretical uh, differentials. Then these stories open up uh, for different ways of reading them, but not in a kind of a antiquarian way. I'm an antiquarian by uh, training and have nothing against uh, classical uh, understanding. In fact, anything I've said is predicated on solid scholarship that has been done by previous generations of scholars. But if they are to become relevant and potent and suggestive to our contemporary lived experiences, then we need to perform what Spivak rightly calls epistemic violence on them, it's epistemic violence that is not peculiar to our generation of scholarship, but in fact has sustained itself throughout uh, uh, centuries. And in fact, you might even say when Avicenna put the pen to paper in that uh, prison, uh, he was per uh, performing an epistemic violence on them. Now, there is another way of reading all of this, which is in the tradition of uh, uh, what in Arabic we call adab sujun, uh, the uh, literature of uh, prison, or in Persian we call hapsiyat. In Arabic we also call the hapsiyat, but that opens up a whole different uh, ball game, which I don't want to conflate right now with the very limited that I wish to share with you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Daboshi, for that that extraordinary um, meditation really on 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 you know some 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 texts some questions that are deep rooted in in our field um, and I, I have my own questions my own 
things that I'd like to ask about, but I, I think the place to start is with the questions that have so far gone into our Q&A. Um, uh, and uh, I, uh, I encourage attendees who haven't put in a question yet um, uh, to put them in if uh, you have any. Um, so um, our first question from, um, I apologize if I mispronounce the name, Jason um, NG um, says, thanks for your wide ranging talk and reminder to engage with contemporary scholarship in Persian and Arabic, which I think is something that we're all more conscious of now than, than in decades past, maybe, well, variably. Uh, do you have a sense of which and how classical commentators in Persian and Arabic theorized about these stories slash treatises slash allegories? Uh, first of all, I'm grateful that uh, our colleague is uh, picking up on the issue of my almost fanatical fixation that the scholarship that is done by our colleagues in Persian, in Arabic, in Turkish, in Urdu, in all, the, all of these languages are of a stellar quality. And one has to just uh, uh, find them, engage with them, and bring them into the conversation. In the age of you know, internet, there is no excuse for us not to, uh, not to do so. But uh, in terms of the substance, yes, the, the, story, the three stories of uh, Avicenna have always been of concern uh, to generations of uh, scholars. Razi, for example, dismissed them, says, oh, this is just gibberish. It doesn't, uh, Avicenna, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I have no idea what he's talking about. Whereas uh, uh, Tusi, uh, in his Sharul Ishara, takes them very seriously and begins to explain what, I mean, first of all, in sort of explanatory way and, and a positivistic way, what these stories actually mean. But then they make the epistemic jump of trying to say, okay, Salomon is Agle Kul or uh, Absal is Nafse uh, Ammare. That correspondence that is sort of to which any interpreter is entitled is a leap of faith. That is, you have to say, okay, if you say so. But as I said at the beginning, you always go back to the compelling, what uh, Paul Dumont calls the figural, the figurative disposition of the allegorical language that they always allow for alternative reading. We don't even have to go to Paul Dumont. Uh, uh, Al-Ghazat al-Hamadani has a wonderful phrase in his Tamhidat. Uh, he calls it Mushtarik al-Dilale, Mushtarik al-Dilale, uh, multi-significatory, that these essays or this prose is multi-significatory, or in Duman's language, figurative, and as a result, always generate their alternatives. So thank you. Um... And uh, uh, so maybe before I read uh, uh, the, uh, the more remark-like um, comment from um, Professor Van Bladel, um, uh, our colleague um, Jane Michelson um, says, uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Would you be willing to speculate about how modern disciplinary formations, which tend to keep literature, science, and philosophy at a distance from each other, might skew scholarly approaches to Avicenna's and Sohravardi's allegories? Uh, I think like any other intelligent question, the, the answer is in it. That is, we are sort of victims of this uh, scholarly disciplinary formations. I mean, at the same time, uh, at least in my generation of scholars, this notions of uh, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinarity has tried to resolve them. But the issue is uh, uh, the, what I, the term that I use from Spivak, epistemic violence, uh, you have to sort of defy this disciplinary formations, but in a cautious way. I'm not shooting from the hip or let's throw away all of these disciplines. That is, that is nonsense. These disciplines have enabled us uh, as epistemes to be able to produce knowledge. But at the same time, I believe that their epistemes have been exhausted. And as a result, generations change and different kinds of readings. What uh, 
what I'm proposing, Sam, namely taking the literary disposition of these prose rather than what they could mean philosophically or mystically or politically or anything that is as a literary prose, pay closer attention to them, is one such uh, interdisciplinary that you bring uh, uh, literary hermeneutics, if I were to use that, into the reading of this document, it, it is uh, prose. Uh, that would uh, yield, hopefully, if done cautiously, uh, to new insight as to how they need. Thank you. Um, so, so I'll follow uh, now with um, Professor Van Bladel's um, uh, responses to a couple of points in, in terms of the way that you characterized um, Professor Gutas's um, work on Avicenna. Um, you know, first he he remarks that um, that the um, Professor Gutas's book um, Avicenna and the Aristotelian tradition, while it has you know, a shorter term, I stand corrected. All the power to Gutas and whoever decided that this extraordinary work deserves recognition. We stand corrected. Yes, and I mean, he also mentions that uh, this uh, reference to sort of the the distinction between audiences, you know, and 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 the 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 place of philosophy relative to the common people is not is not Gutas's own. It's it's derived from how uh, um, uh, the major figures of the Falsafa tradition articulated. Um, the the sort of different audiences uh, um yeah i agree with this uh report but i am not quite sure that when uh avicenna or sohravardi or more often than not than not ghazali even they refer to common people they have the same conception as uh, for example in kimya i saw that when ghazali is writing in persian he says you know, uh, some of my uh, friends have asked me to write in Persian. Of course, I have said all of these things in uh, in Ahiyaul Medin. However, these people want me to write in Persian. I write it in Persian. So uh, uh, there is a difference. Uh, our colleague, Professor Van Bladel, is correct that there are references to common people, but I'm not quite sure if what they mean by common people is what today we mean by common people. Right. Um, and so then, so then, lastly, um, Professor Van Bladel is sort of helping us to historicize what the intervention of Gutas is in relation to the sort of prevailing ways of thinking about uh, philosophers such as Ibn Sina. Um, that you know, that in you know, Corbin's work had done a certain amount to situate it within you know this kind of mystical tradition that, you know, whatever we might think of. I, of I, need, not, I, I need not be convinced. If I am to use uh, choose between uh, Dimitri Gutas, tremendous uh, respect and admiration that I have for him, and Henri Corbin, I, I go with Gutas. The reason is that Gutas never expects me to uh, take a leap of, uh, a leap of uh, faith. I'm always with him. I mean, sort of disagree with him here and there, but he he is solid. Corbin, uh, yeah, yeah. Corbin was translating Heidegger into French. Then he changed his mind and came to Iran and started translating, you know, Soravardi and uh, and Molossadre, etc. And yes, he does require a leap of faith that I, for one, am not willing uh, to give. So I'm not. But the, the, going back to the point I was making uh, in response to Professor Van Bladel. I'm not choosing side. If I were to choose side, I will choose Dimitri Gutas' side. What I am concerned with is the differential between Korban and uh, Gutas, between Persian and Arabic, between uh, uh, those who sort of antiquarian and stick to the Avicenna's time and are very sort of historicists in that respect. And, uh, and my attempt to bring them forward not again asking you that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence, say, between Shahrush Parsipur's blue intellect and Sohravari's red intellect, but that the translation and availability and sort of uh, celebration of uh, Sohravari and Avicenna, et cetera, in 
Iran in the Iranian context generates a, a domain of uh, uh, attraction that then invariably affects cinema, literature, poetry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm entirely on the same side with Professor Bladel that I am on Gutas's uh, uh, side of this, but that differential, which is important to scholarship, at this point of my theoretical meditation, Sam, as you put it rightly, is not my concern. Uh, is um, going different, different direction. Um, so, uh, because we have a sort of lull in the questions, um, I, I wondered if I might take uh, this opportunity to bring another uh, work onto the table here that seemed to me to be lurking in the background here, and I wondered whether you had it in mind. Um, uh, which is Ernst Bloch's uh, uh, Avicenna and the Aristotelian uh, and the Aristotelian left, um, like both because you know very much contemporary with and to some degree engaged with Corbin, he's he's he represents this kind of no, very definitely non-historicist, but maybe in some ways productive, you know, recuperation of the Avicennan tradition. Um, I mean, for, from a position of far less, you know, real knowledge, although it, it's my sense that, you know, what, part of what he's engaged with there in East Germany in the late 40s is uh, the sort of, he's aware of, he's reading stuff from the Soviet preparations for the um, Avicenna um, millennial celebration, um, uh, which is, you know, like all this Soviet stuff is is trying to recuperate, uh, you know, a, a sort of native genealogy for radicalism. For yeah, uh, listen, uh, I'm I'm a I'm a product of that generation of translation of Russian uh, Marxist uh, historical materialism into Persian uh, by extremely competent translators, and then the translations were given to a religious scholar to kind of take issue with them. And we were beneficiaries of Russian scholarship, magnificent Persian translations, and a sort of nitpicking uh, by some religious scholars. So, oh no, Tabari didn't say this, but Zamakhshari said this and, and what have you. So I'm, I'm again, uh, uh, but uh, Ernst Bloch doesn't enter into this field of scholarship the way the scholarship of Gutas and the speculations of uh, Corban, who was very prolific. Uh, now, there is also another aspect of uh, Corban kind of attending or catering to uh, Iranian nativism in a way. Thus, people were paying very close attention to him, like Seth Hossein Nash and Darush Shaigan. And so he became kind of a guru for, with them. But also, Seth Hossein Nash took uh, Korban to uh, meet with Alamet Tabo Tabai, and their conversations became very productive. And then other philosophers like uh, uh, Jalal Ashtiani began to reflect on them. So he became an Iranian phenomenon, as it were. Uh, to the degree that uh, this, I'm delighted to hear that Gutas's book received recognition and prize, richly deserved, but still that, that is a governmental agency after the revolution and auto automatically comes with suspicion, not that Gutas's work is suspicious, but that kind of prize is suspicious, doesn't make it into a popular phenomenon the same way that say uh, the original Persian text of Agle Sorch results in a major novel like Agle Abi, the blue, blue intellect. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, since we've got this time, I, I mean, um, I, I want to draw you out a little bit more on, on, you know, these questions of genre and style um, that, you're, that you're thinking about here in, in this very literary way, right? I mean, that, that, part of your resistance to making allegory the answer to the question, right? Like, um, you know, whatever the allegorical component might be, you know, not, not allowing, you know, that to be the interpretative key, right? I mean, would you talk a little bit more about, about what, what contemporaneous works, I mean, obviously these works are generically odd, 
Um, but you know what contemporaneous or prior works uh, you think of, you know, Ibn Sina's, um, you know, the, these these texts, whatever we would call them, um, belong among, you know, when he was writing them, what is the sort of cluster of texts among which he imagined that his readers would be having their horizon of expectations for how to read them? As you know, in his autobiography, uh, Avicenna tells us that, for example, he was reading Aristotle's Metaphysics and could not make tail from head from tail until he ran into Al-Farabi's commentary on it in a bazaar and he picked it up. I wish I was in one of those bazaars and picked it up. And now, every, and he says, because by now I knew uh, the whole text by heart, uh, I knew what, uh, how to interpret it. Uh, so as, uh, as and Gutas in his scholarship, in his work on Avicenna, he tells us, there's a wonderful uh, essay that he has on Oriental philosophy, Al-Falsafa Mashraqiyya, whether Al-Falsafa Mashraqiyya was a real project, as Corban says. I mean, the, uh, Corban and Gutas are the yin-yang of, uh, of this field. I mean, again, I never met uh, Corban, but I have met and I have deep love and affection for uh, Dimitri. He was close. He was a teacher of Ahmad Dallal, my close friend. Uh, not not teacher, so a colleague of Ahmad Dallal. Uh, the, uh, the the thing is that whether or not, going back Sam, to your question, whether or not this falsafa mashriqiya, Oriental philosophy, was something that, as Gutas says in his essay, well, he was experimenting with it, but didn't go wrong and abandoned it. Uh, whereas Corbin says, oh, oh, no, 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 no. This is the thing. This is falsafa mashriqiyya. This is Oriental philosophy. We haven't known it. And then he offers these three treatises, Risalat Tir, Salaman Absal, and so forth, as inroad into, uh, into how to uh, read them. Uh, but in my humble opinion, uh, Neither Gutas's definitive answer, no, this um, falsafa mashraqiyya didn't go anywhere. That was it was experimenting, didn't work. Nor Corban's gung ho shooting from the hip. Oh, hello, we have discovered a new philosophy. Is uh, is is thing, sort of uh, uh, holes. Again, for that reason, my own philosophical and theoretical predilection has to do with. Uh, the two seminal theorists of allegory, uh, Benjamin and Paul Dumont. For Benjamin, in his Trauerspiel, uh, his uh, theorization of the uh, uh, Baroque theater, uh, allegory are relics, are remnants, are fragments. And if you combine that with what Paul Dumont says, that the language of the allegory is figurative, when he in his work on Rousseau, and as a result, as figurative language, they're productive. Then my way of reading all of these, not just productive crisis of what the hell did they mean by these uh, treatises? Because Ibn Tufayl begins uh, by in his his Ahay Ibn Yaghzan, oh yes, Avicenna this, but he just goes off tangent to an, an entirely different story, which is even more fantastic and, and exciting by virtue of their allegorical disposition. Now using allegory in the sense that Benjamin and Dumont uses, they become uh, self-generative. They become multi-significatory. as in Ozad would say. And as a result, every new generation, including this very conversation that we are having, somehow or another turns to these proses, one in Arabic, one in Persian, the original, uh, and try to sort of wet them to our contemporary realities. My link to contemporary realities is the fact that in 1950s, 60s, and 70s, just before the revolution, uh, these original, the, the critical editions of uh, Sohravardi in particular created a social phenomenon. Uh, not just in uh, literature, but also in poetry, but also in 
uh, cinema. And as a student of this period, I take this seriously. And once you take it seriously, from here on is, as you said, meditative. Is not, uh, I'm not sure if Gutas would be with me if I say, Dimitri, here is what Soravadi says in Agla Sorf. Now take a look at what uh, Shahrus Parsiku says in Agla Abi. The two are related. Because he was a solid sort of uh, uh, scholar of the, of the text. And this kind of speculative links that I make are not of the nature of Kurban, but they are sociologically grounded. And as a result, the pregnant disposition of that prose that continues to resonate, especially with this astonishing, mysterious way that uh, Soravadi says, I was asleep, I couldn't, uh, couldn't sleep, I woke up. And I was of age that I was just exiting the women's quarters and was allowed into men's quarters. I came out and had a candle and this and that happened. Is dramaturgical, it's uh, dramatic, it's uh, exciting, it's unusual. And that uh, is not just for our generation. I dare say it has been for all other generations. Um, there, there's... There's much more to be said about this, this approach to allegory, but I, I wonder, um, um, Professor Gutas, um, uh, is there any chance that you would want to uh, put in a word? Um, oh, this is there. Yes, yes. No, I mean, it just seems like uh, if, if he's able, yeah, that, here, here he is. Uh, uh, well, let's, we'll, we'll see if, if he uh, emerges, would love uh, to uh, to hear from him. Yeah. yeah, can you hear from me? Yes, I do. Hello, Hamid. How are you? <laughs> I'm good to hear you. Nice to hear you. Uh, well, I don't know if you want to see me too. That's all right. Doesn't make. Plus, I don't have much uh, time. Uh, no, thank you very much. I mean, this is, uh, as I said, wonderful meditation. <laughs> this is a wonderful disquisition and bringing up Paul Deman and uh, uh, Benjamin and everything. Excellent. The, the, the only point that, uh, it's not even a point, uh, thing that to be, to be mentioned is that uh, this is beautiful, but what does it have to do with Avicenna? I mean, he was, he was the original creator of this story that's what it is, but the way people read it, especially now what uh, playwrights and um, novelists uh, do out of it and what they get out of it, this is one, I mean, that's exactly what, of course, great minds do. They put out their ideas and they are very productive and fecund over centuries and they create all these beautiful things and that's excellent. But if you wanna go back to the, uh, uh, to the original story, to the author himself, uh, what he wanted to do, uh, we have to be, well, historicism is not really a bad word. We have to try and understand he was trying to do something. And uh, so we'll have to see what it was that he was trying to do. And we can say this, that, and the other, we can try the different possibilities. And the colleagues and I, well, Guachon primarily, uh, and I you know we came up, well, that's what he tried to do. And uh, that's, I think what uh, uh, we think he did, but of course, it may have been other things as well, but we are willing to uh, see what anybody else has to say, but not to uh, transpose Avicenna from his time and place and his purpose of what he was doing to what it, that interests us and what we want to see and what we want to do. And that is, uh, that, that's, that's the only thing, otherwise, it's it's uh, it's wonderful. I mean, Avicenna wrote in a different kinds of genres. I mean, he he wrote poetry, uh, so uh, and he wrote what well, didactic poetry, but it was poetry as well. Uh, he wrote this inimitable isharat, uh, which is uh, well quite unique as a as a as a as a style, so to speak, Arabic uh, uh, prose style expository. It's supposed to be. So, I mean, he called the Sharat with on behalf in any case, uh, as such. And uh, so he, uh, uh, and of course, he wrote these uh, stories. So we have to try and find out what it was that he was doing. And uh, I 
simply thought that the best way that I can understand all that is that he really wanted to reach people, as many people as possible. With, well, with the didactic poems, I guess it is easy uh, to say, well, obviously you wanted to reach people who wanted to learn something, and it was easy to learn to memorize something in Rajas when it is basically uh, rhyming, etc. So you can learn it, fine. And the Sharat Wutan Bihat, I think even that we can say, he wanted people to start digging uh, into his, uh, his works and try and find out where he explains this and that and the other. And that particular style serves that purpose. So uh, similar to that would be the, uh, 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 the so-called, well, allegories, whatever, these tales, uh, we should call them, in case, again, allegory has so much ideology behind it, the way that you presented it, I mean, that I don't want to say that, these, these tales that he, that, that he wrote, uh, well, we thought basically he was trying to say this thing to people that would understand it easier, which is very close to his theory of prophecy in any case. Uh, the prophet understands things uh, uh, philosophically, but he cannot repeat them out uh, philosophically because people won't understand it, who understand syllogisms. Uh, so he comes out with uh, symbols and uh, this and that and the other, and that's how you get the uh, religious text, basically. So similar to that is what he, uh, I think, tried to do with his uh, tales. So anyway, if that is the account of what he did, this is uh, fine. But of course, this in no way diminishes anybody else's interpretation of what he wants to make out of it for himself, for his society, and for his time, and uh, whatever it is, because obviously this is the, uh, the thing to do. So um, that's just what uh, I thought we should be, uh, uh, I mean, as I said, to make that thing is, is, is okay. And beyond that, of course, to find out what you are saying that uh, uh, there is so much uh, uh, literature uh, on these uh, subjects and on these tales as well. And of course, on other similar things like the Kalila Wadimna, for example, take it that it's, uh, it's an amazing, uh, thing that uh, it got translated into so many languages and it got its own uh, uh, history and influences, etc. So it's uh, just to, to, to make the different levels that we are discussing, I think that should be made clear. Thank you, anyway, but that was uh, wonderful to. Uh, to hear that. <laughs> I will have very little time to respond. First of all, I'm delighted that Dimitri, you're here. Uh, and as I have said repeatedly, I'm a great admirer of uh, your scholarship. And there's nothing that you said in terms of your singular uh, attempt to figure out what in the world did, not just in these stories, uh, throughout his scholarship, uh, his uh, philo philosophy, what he's doing, your work is definitive to the field. Uh, and what I'm suggesting in no way diverges or compromises the significance of that scholarship. My uh, issue is uh, begins with, uh, in fact, the dif what I call differential. Mm -hmm. Urban was an equally competent reader of the original texts and so forth. And his project was different. He didn't think that he was shoving, doing epistemic violence to these texts. He, he thought that this is what Avicenna meant and that this was the beginning of Falsafa Mashtariya in your wonderful essays that you on Falsafa Mashtariya. And if, as I said at the beginning, if I were to choose that in this room, Dimitri Butas is giving a talk and in the other room, uh, uh, Henri Gorban is giving a talk, I'll come to the room that Dimitri Butas is giving a, a talk. But sit there after that come and say hello Dimitri how are you let's go have a beer but my project is neither yours nor uh Corban's. my project is the social history of texts this is straight out, out of uh, Stewart Hall namely a text is coded and then a reception decodes it and that is a historical phenomenon and your scholarship speaks to scholars People who say, okay, X plus X equals uh, this. But that kind of a speculative writings that uh, uh, Corbin did, that then suddenly is uh, immediately translated and commented upon. And he comes to Tehran and he meets with all of these philosophers and they begin to react to him. 
uh, it's, that is a social phenomenon. Yeah. is not a scholarly phenomenon. And that social phenomenon as a social history of the text of Sohravardi and so forth begins to have influence on cinema and all of this. It's not the question whether Shahnush Parsipur's novella or blue intellect is really related to uh, Avicenna or not, or uh, Sohravardi or not. The question is a social fact. And that social fact, for me as a student of the social history of texts is crucial as is your i mean without your work we are just out in the shooting from the hip but your work is a measure that you say what would responsible historical uh, scholarship do for us to understand what are the domains and parameters and uh, uh, idiomaticity of uh, of a philosopher like avicenna is but that idiomaticity is not what is, or the historical setting of that idiomaticity is not the concern of people like Kurban or his numerous followers in, in Iran. Uh, but as a student of the social history of text, what he did is, uh, is important. This is the only thing that's sort of a footnote that I will add to your... Uh, no, no, you're absolutely right. And this is, I mean, I myself am very much interested in the uh, influence of, I mean, one has to uh, read a text the way it was understood in a particular society, for what reason, for what purpose, what ideological uh, currents there were there, which are uh, all, all perfectly fine and very interesting, as a matter of fact, and should be so studied. I mean, that is that is the thing. The only difference with Corbin is that uh, I, I appreciate very much what he did and how he was understood and, uh, about this, so the, the, the history of the text and how it was influencing, except that he also said that this is what Avicenna said. <laughs> yes. I mean, he, he could have said, Avicenna said this, but that's how it was taken, that's how, should, or that, that's how I should take it, so to speak, given my proclivities and what interests me in life and in thought. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's, that's perfectly fine, I have no problem with it. The problem is with uh, saying that this is what Avicenna said, and that's not true. <laughs> that's the... <laughs> You don't need to come. <laughs> That's what. Right. Otherwise, yeah, good that's... to hear your voice, Dimitri. Is uh, wonderful. Yes, very good to thank you very, very much. Dimitri. My pleasure. And this is the sort of tension involved in any kind of reception studies. Is yeah, know, yes, yes. Yeah. No, yeah, this the... is the reception studies, which is of course you should be done. I mean, for heaven's sake. Uh, in re reception studies, you have it in all sorts of uh, uh, things. I mean, right now. Uh, in my new work, I'm just saying that um, the rise of Plato's Republic as the text from classical antiquity, right. recent phenomenon, and in fact, Xenophon's Cyropedia was historically far more important. It was a classmate yes. of uh, Plato. Yes. So uh, the reception, the question is with which uh, Dimitri uh, concurs, the reception is why happened that oh, suddenly this text become uh, so widely received. I mean, I did not know that Dimitri's uh, book has been received and celebrated. Uh, so I'm delighted to hear that. I hope that it is also translated into Persian and posited as an alternative way of reading Avicenna and Soravardi. Uh, because in the secondary literature, quote unquote, of a scholarship that is done in Persian that I follow very closely and in Arabic, you see, particularly in Persian, because of the genealogy of the Institute of Royal Philosophy, and Dimitri knows all of this. Corban uh, uh, became a cult figure, yeah, uh, and people were following him because he was catering to a certain kind of on Islam Iranian, as he called it. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, yeah, it's an appeal, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's 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 fine, of course. But c'est magnifique, mais c'est pas la science. That's not. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, <laughs> as it is. So please go ahead. Uh, but I'm afraid us, yeah, will have to go too as well. So thank you, Dimitri, thank for showing up. Good to hear from, from your voice. Very nice to hear you, Hamid, as well. Take care. Be well. Bye bye. Well, so what? What a wonderful uh, visitation. Uh, with which to I, was, I didn't know Dimitri and, there, and uh, as you saw, being here and not there does not make no difference in my tremendous admiration and love for his work that has generations of my uh, scholarship is indebted to him. Uh, yeah. I mean, as with the 
ubiquitous availability of you know Turkish and Persian and Arabic language scholarship online, you know th these are these are the affordances of 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 this moment um, is us all being able to have these conversations. Um, yes, oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, so I think the last, that time, that... the last time that I saw Dimitri, he may or may not remember, he and I and George Saliba were having lunch in Colombia and uh, Dimitri was about to hire Ahmed Dallal. I mean, we have all histories together. Well, so, 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 yeah, so I, I think we, we'd probably, because of the time, better, uh, better uh, close up shop for, for right now. Uh, were there any final things that you wanted to say before? No, absolutely. I'm delighted. As I said at the beginning, I am uh, sort of, this is very much from the kitchen of my work, what I'm doing, uh, been right, the reading and writing, following the scholarship on Avicenna and Soravardi and trying to uh, kind of recast them in the way I think and I work. And it has been extremely productive uh, productive and uh, I'm grateful that I had a chance to actually share it with you and other colleagues uh, especially Yale because of Dimitri and Paul Dumont's work is very important for me that when I was giving the original title to Marjan that I said I'm going to Yale I'm going to talk about Dimitri and uh, Paul Dumont and their politics are radically different but that's a different story well so, so yeah, so the, the good fortune was all ours uh, and, uh, and we thank you all for, for joining us. Um, this is, as uh, Professor Zadeh mentioned, the last in our fall series of the Iran Colloquium. And uh, stay tuned because in the spring we'll be back with many more exciting talks and, uh, and we look forward to seeing you then. Uh, have a good afternoon, everybody.